Tonight we're going to talk about the seven seals, and then we're going to have another talk on the seven trumpets. And uh, these are thunderous issues. And we are slowly moving into a very important phase when we will be opening up some of the issues that will pertain to our time in a very, very special way. Now, I can only say it as it is, and I pray that as we go through, and there are things which are strange or you do not yet comprehend, or do not even wish to comprehend, that you would not make this an issue to stay away, but to come and see more, until the whole picture becomes clear. It's like a huge mosaic, and all we can do in one evening is put one little block onto the screen, and it looks like patchwork, and we don't really understand the issues. But if we can put one after the other until the picture becomes clearer and clearer and clearer, then the whole import of the book of Revelation will start to become intelligible. So bear with us and bear with me if there are issues which seem strange or perhaps skewed without all the other information that is available. Now the seven seals are dealt with mainly in chapter 6, but uh, to set the stage for the seven seals, there are two other chapters, chapters 4 and 5, and of course it is important to remember that the chapters themselves say nothing, because the numbers in the Bible were added afterwards. The Bible wasn't written like that, the Bible was written as a block. So you cannot really divide it up into the numbers. The numbers are just convenient for finding where you are and uh, how to find a particular text. The Lamb opened one of the seals. Now before he opens the seals to tell us what will happen on this earth, he first gives us a view of the great throne room in heaven. One of the most picturesque views of the throne room of the universe. Just imagine having a look into that tremendous seat of power. Revelation 4 verse 1. After this I looked and behold a door was opened in heaven and the first voice which I had heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me which said come up hither and I will show you things which must be hereafter. So here you have the prophetic view. And immediately I was taken in the spirit and behold a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyselves wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgments of God in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel, Romans 2 verse 5 and 16. What has that got to do with the great throne room? Well, the great throne room is the seat of the king of the universe. And that king of the universe is also the judge of the universe. So before God permits us to look into what is going to happen on this earth, and to look at the apostasies that will come, and the terrible things that men will do, he gives us a view of his majesty and his power, and he gives us the view that in spite of the fact that it looks as if the other side is winning, he's in control. And finally, he will be the judge. And there will come a judgment. So there will be a judgment, an investigation, a pronouncement of judgment, and then will come an executive judgment. And when that executive judgment comes, we better be on the right side. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body. 2 Corinthians 5.10 Make no mistake, Jesus is in control. God is in control. Acts 17 verse 31 Because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men, in that he has raised him from the dead. Make no mistake, Jesus 
will one day put an end to sin. Revelation 4 verse 3, And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sodden stone, and there was a rainbow around about the throne in the sight like unto an emerald. It is inexplicable to explain the glory that John sees here in the throne room of God. And around about the throne were four and twenty seats. Twenty-four seats around the throne. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. So here are twenty-four individuals sitting around the throne of God. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunders and voices. He cannot even explain the glory that he sees. He just sees flashes of light and uh, the voice of God like thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now we explained this before. God is one. There is one spirit. But the seven represents the time periods as we went through them. God is in control in all ages, including the one we are living in now. Now, who are these 24 elders? Now, in the earthly sanctuary, there were also 24 elders, and we read about it in the book of Chronicles, chapter 24, verse 7, and it tells us the lot fell and came forth to Europe and second to Jediah, and then it goes through them all, the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth and the seventh. And it tells us who these elders were that were chosen. And it details every single one right through down to verse 19. And uh, 23, 24 elders. These were the orderings of them in their service to come into the house of the Lord according to their manner under Aaron, their father, as the Lord God of Israel had commanded him. So in the earthly sanctuary, there were 24 elders that officiated with the high priest, who was Aaron. So if the earthly was a type of the heavenly, then in the heavenly there are 24 elders who officiate with the high priest, who is Jesus, in the heavenly sanctuary. It would be interesting to know who they are, but of course we are not told who they are, but we can speculate some. Revelations 4, 6, and before the throne there was a sea of glass. He just sees this magnificent light that you could walk on, like under crystals, and in the midst of the throne and around about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Now, who are they? And the first beast was like a lion, and the second like a calf, and the third beast had the face of a man, and the fourth beast like a flying eagle, and the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Interesting statement. So who are they? Well, in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 2, we have another statement that can help us. It says, above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain, with two, he covered his face, and with twain, two, he covered his feet, and with twain, he did fly. So we're talking about cherubims. These are an order of angelic beings. They were so magnificent and so imposing and they looked so powerful that John describes them as beasts. And he gives them the attributes of the lion and the calf and the man and the flying eagle. But you can see with what reverence they stand before God. It gives you an, an idea of the holiness of God. Now who do they represent? Well, the traditional view is that the lion stands for strength. The calf stands for endurance, the man for intelligence, and the flying eagle for swiftness. So they can see all things around them, they are aware of all things, and they are the ones closest to God. Covering cherubs, if you like. Another view is that they reflect the attributes of Christ. You see, the lion is a symbol of a king, and Jesus 
is the king. The calf, or the heifer, is the one that serves, that pulls the plow, if you like, and so it is a symbol of Christ the servant. The man, he has the appearance of a man. Christ became man for us, so it represents his humanity. And the flying eagle in the scriptures is used as a symbol of divinity. Jesus says, I will lift you up as an eagle. Under the wings you will be. So it's a symbol of divinity. It's interesting that the occult world uses these four symbols also for its deity. So if Satan was a covering cherub and he is now a fallen angel, then he wanted to be like the Most High, then it's interesting that these are the attributes which he claims for himself as well. So you see, if you see symbols, sometimes we freak about all the symbols, but many of them are actually drawn from the scriptures and Satan is counterfeiting them to his own purposes. But in the throne room of God, you see the Lamb of God. He is king, he is servant, he is human, he became man for us, but he is divine. That would be the symbolism. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him. Very interesting. That liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Now the Bible is very clear as to who the Creator is. All things were created by the Word of Jesus Christ, says the Bible. But we will deal with that in another lecture. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Chapter 5, verse 1. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven, so there are some people in heaven, nor in the earth, neither under the earth, so none of the dead either would have qualified, no matter how good they were, whether they were Abraham's or whether they were King David's or whether they were Adam himself, none of them qualified was open, able to open the book, neither to look thereon. So who were these people that he saw in heaven? Now, the cherubs, we can understand, they were angels. But the 24 elders? Well, the Bible says that when Jesus rose from the dead, the graves were opened. Isn't that right? And the first fruits rose from the dead. And the Bible says when he entered into heaven, when he ascended into heaven, he took captives in his train. Isn't that right? So people that had been redeemed throughout the ages were raised from the dead at that stage and went with him to heaven. The Bible also tells us that there are some other individuals in heaven. Enoch, for example, was translated without seeing death and was taken up into heaven. Isn't that right? Elijah, as a representative of those who will be translated after the flood, was also taken up by the chariots of God into heaven. Isn't that right? So Elijah is there. And then there's an interesting verse in, in uh, Judah where Michael argues with Satan over the body of Moses. So Moses had a special resurrection and was taken up into heaven. And that is why Elijah and Moses could appear on the Mount of Transfiguration and support Christ in the time of his agony before he went through the episodes that confronted him in his final hours. So there are a number of individuals in heaven 
And of those, obviously, there are 24 that serve in the heavenly uh, sanctuary as the 24 elders. Who exactly? We do not know. We could speculate that Moses might be one of them, or that um, Elijah and Enoch, but the other names, we just don't have them. We'll see one day. We'll find out who they were. But the uh, interesting story. So the earthly a type of the heavenly. But no man was worthy to open the seals. Whether he was worthy enough in the eyes of God to have been taken up into heaven made no difference. Because no man in heaven and no man on earth and no man under the earth that had ever lived would have been worthy to open the seals. But fortunately, there is a solution. Revelation 5 verse 4, And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. Now this document was sealed with seven seals. In the old days, they used to seal, in Roman times, a testament, a last will and testament with seven seals. And of course, if that is not opened, then there is no inheritance. So if the seven-sealed book is not open, there is no inheritance and we are forever lost. That is why he wept. But if they could be opened and the will be read and there be an execution of the will, then we could be redeemed. And there is only one who left a will and testament and lives in order to receive it. Because normally when you die and you leave a will and testament, you have to depend on someone else to open it. Isn't that right? And to execute it. And if the only one who can inherit it is the one who died, well then you have a problem because the one who's dead is dead and can't inherit it anymore. Unless, of course, he is God and has been resurrected through his own power. Wow. And so we find that one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. So all is not lost. The God-man is there. And I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne. So what does that make him? If he is in the midst of the throne, well, then he is sitting in the seat of deity. And of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns, horn the seat of power, kingship over all the ages. He is a king. If you look in the book of Daniel, we'll see that a horn stands for a king or a kingdom. And seven eyes he sees throughout the ages, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth, not part of it. Verse 7, And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. So the prayers of the saints are represented as incense. And the merit of Christ make the prayers acceptable to God. Wonderful imagery that we have here. And heavenly music fills the throne room as they worship the Lamb. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast, and here is the answer, slain, and has redeemed us to God by thy blood. So, these four and twenty elders that are saying this, were they humans or were they angels? They must have been humans. Why? Because they are redeemed. That's right. So we know that there are humans in heaven right now who were redeemed, and the ones that are in heaven are those that went up in the first fruits, as we said, and the three that we know of that the Bible mentions that were translated or had a special resurrection. 
For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. That gets rid of all exclusivity. So there are some that believe today that salvation is by birth. Have you noticed that there are people like that? People who believe in salvation by birth? They say, I belong to the right race, or I belong to the right ethnic group, therefore I am saved. The Jews had that particular theology, and there are many groups in the world today that they, who believe that they are saved as a consequence of their particular stature. There are many interesting beliefs out there. Salvation by name, salvation by hat. But I won't get into that. Some people believe that if you have the right dress, then you are redeemed. And they represent them like themselves like that to the world. You are not saved by your birth. You are not saved by what you wear or how you conform to this, that or the other position. You are saved through your relationship with Jesus Christ. That is how you are saved. So he is the one that redeems us by his blood out of every kindred, tongue, and people, and nation, lest we should boast that one is better than another. And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Fascinating text. We shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels around about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. So we're dealing with billions here. Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. So you have this tremendous view of the scene in heaven showing that the final victor is going to be who? Jesus Christ. So we have nothing to fear. It's interesting that God gives us this view, and then he shifts the emphasis to tell us what's going to happen on this earth. And the two are in such contrast with each other that it's scary. Scary. And one might believe that Christianity is the loser on this issue. Did you know that the greatest apparent victory for Satan was his greatest defeat? When he had Jesus nailed to that cross and he was triumphing in his power and glory, he actually sounded his death now. And so it will be with the whole Christian church. The greatest apparent defeat will be turned by the merits of Jesus Christ into the greatest victory that the universe has ever seen. Make no mistake, Jesus is in control. And when we go through the next lectures, remember those words, because there are going to be some scary things we are going to talk about. But we can whistle and smile and sing hymns because we know the outcome already. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as they are in the sea, that's the symbol of the nations, and all that are in them heard, I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. It'll be a universal, eternal kingdom. And the four beasts, the cherubs, said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders, who had been redeemed, remember, fell down and... Worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Right. Having shifted from the great throne room scene, we move to the story of the horses of Revelation. The opening of the seals. The Lamb opened one of the seals. Revelation 6 verse 1. And he sees a horse, a rider on a white horse, come forth Conquering. Now, again, we are going to go through seven time periods. Now, the time periods obviously 
recapitulate what we saw before when we dealt with the seven churches. Because the seven churches tell us about the nature of God's church. With all its defects, God doesn't hide anything. And he tells us this is what's going to happen to the church. Now, these horses represent something else. They're going to recapitulate the same time periods, but they're going to concentrate on the message, on the gospel herald. So not so much the position of the church that is to herald the information, but the actual message that has to go out to the world. And Satan, of course, is as opposed to that message as he was to the Son of God. He hates it with a passion. So when this horse goes out white, what is the color white? What does it represent? Righteousness. The Bible tells us it represents righteousness. And there is nobody righteous but Christ. And he has a bow in his hand. So there are a number of symbols that we can look at. And then there is a, another rider, one with a red horse. Then there is a black one and then there is a dead one with a dead rider. So who are these riders? Revelation 6 verse 1 and 2, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, there's a clue, and a crown, there's another clue, and was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. So there's a war here. This is a war. You go out to conquer in a war situation. Psalm 64 verse 7 will give us a clue. But God shall shoot at them with an arrow. Who shall shoot? God. Suddenly shall they be wounded. So who's the one who has the bow? It's God. Was the Lord displeased against the rivers? Was thine anger against the rivers? Was thy wrath against the sea, and that thou didst ride upon thine horses and thy chariots of salvation? Thy bow, there we have the clue, was made quite naked, according to the oaths of the tribes, even thy word, Selah, thou didst cleave the earth with rivers. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 8 and 9. Here we have a nice clue. Is God concerned with conquering the planet in terms of earthly thinking? No. This is a message. It's the word of God, and the arrow is the one that shoots and brings the gospel into the heart. And the first message that went out when Jesus started his fledgling church was the message of salvation through Jesus Christ, and it went out with power and purity because God had cleansed for himself a people that were willing to stand for righteousness and truth, the early church. So the gospel herald that went out was unadulterated. Everybody knew that Jesus Christ was Lord. He alone was able to save and that through his blood we are redeemed. That is the story that went out into the world to bring the gospel heralds. So it's a conquering faith. White represents a pure faith. A white woman, the woman dressed in white in Revelation, represents truth in its purity. The bride that has been redeemed and washed in the blood of the Lamb. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. Colossians 1 verse 23. It's very important. If you accept this message, and you are anchored on the rock, so that you cannot be moved then you are settled in the truth. And in order to be settled in the truth so that you cannot be moved, you have to know the word of God and you have to eat it. That means to internalize it and to act accordingly. And we will see that to be so settled in the truth that you cannot be moved is a very important point that we'll be dealing with in a moment. So the second seal is opened and here comes 
a red horse. Red is the color of what? Sacrifice. It's the color of blood. It's the color of sacrifice. So when we looked at the seven churches, the first one was Ephesus. Do you remember? And it was a church that had a good message. And it was a pure doctrine. And they had discernment. They could see who those were that called themselves Jews, Christians, and were not and who tried to infiltrate even at that early stage, but discernment kept them out. And then came another church that was called Smyrna. Do you remember that? Mir. And what happened there? There was a time of great persecution, and the blood flowed. So here, blood is flowing, and the reason why this blood is flowing is because Satan is counteracting the gospel message and he's doing everything in his power to corrupt it. Those true to principle would rather die than give it up and those not true to principle, what would they do? They would start compromising. And so the road to compromise was slowly opened. And the red gospel horse went out. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth. And that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Now what is the sword? The word of God. So that's the issue. The word of God. Out it goes. It says one thing. This brings about war. And war is painful. War leads to death. And some people get tired of the process. So a blood-stained faith is the next one. It's a time of great persecution, Roman persecution, with Nero, and all the issues we dealt with when we dealt with the churches. So it covers the same time period up to the time of Constantine, when persecution was the method, me method to get rid of the Gospel Herald. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny and see that thou hurt not the oil and the wine. These are interesting symbols. So here is a balance and the color is black. Now black is obviously the opposite of white. Isn't that right? So something is happening to taint the whiteness of the pure gospel herald. It becomes black. And there's something that becomes very scarce. Wheat and barley. And then there is something else that is in trouble. Wine and oil. Now these symbols stand, all of them stand for the gospel herald. You see, the wheat is a symbol of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem, Bet Lechem, the bread basket. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Jesus is the living bread that comes down from heaven. So the bread is in trouble. And the barley was the first harvest that took place in Israel. The barley harvest. In fact, the wave offering was from barley sheep. And it represents also the resurrection in Jesus Christ and the body of Christ, the herald. So the wheat and the barley will become scarce. The gospel message of salvation in Christ is under pressure. But God is still working and he says, do not harm the oil and the wine. What does the oil stand for? It's the symbol of the Holy Spirit. It was poured into the candlesticks so that the world might have the light of truth. And wine is a symbol of doctrine. Jesus says, 
You cannot pour new wine into old wine skins. You cannot pour the great message of salvation in Christ into a mold that will not contain it. So the wine is a symbol of the gospel. Jesus also says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He is the one that gives us life through his gospel herald. So these are the issues that are being put under pressure, compromised if you like. So the black horse obviously represents a time when the word of God becomes scarce. And this is when the compromise issue comes in. So this is the time when Constantine married paganism to Christianity. So it's a compromised faith if we follow the same time periods. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock to feed the church of God, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in amongst you. So by the way, how early in the church would corrupting influences come in? Right in the beginning. Right in the beginning. There was a man called Simon Magus. Do you remember him in the Bible? And he thought he could buy the power of God with his money. Do you remember that? And Peter rebuked him to his face. And he was upset about it. He was very upset about it. And uh, Simon Magus was from Sumeria. And he had a taint of Babylonian wisdom. And if we go into the history as we see in the future, he was probably the father of Gnosticism. And Gnosticism is the issue where Christ is made less than he is so that we can become greater than we are, in a nutshell. And Gnosticism was the thorn in the flesh of early Christianity and Gnosticism is the controlling factor today, as we will see in future lectures. The cross of Christ was the divide of history. But it cast down the truth to the ground and it practiced and it prospered. Daniel 8 verse 12, there would come a power that would destroy the gospel herald. Salvation through Christ alone was replaced by the requirements of the church. So that's basically what happened. And the church set itself up as the mediator between man and God. Instead of going directly to Christ, you went through the church. A very sad day. God had given a law and man had the effrontery to change the law of God to suit his own needs. So in the churches we have St. Peter, or was it Jupiter? Well, actually it came straight out of a temple of Jupiter. In the churches, Mary became a mediatrix, a mediator. And the church teaches that nobody can be saved except through the merits of Mary. That's very strange. So all these issues came in and they were a mingling of paganism and Christianity. The Bible says quite clearly there is no other name under heaven on earth whereby you may be saved except the name Christ Jesus. There is no other name. So all these other mediators started coming in and where the pagans had many, many, many gods, so they just developed many, 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 many saints. And then you could, if you had a problem in your life, and you came short on merit, salvation by works, in order to enter into heaven, well then you could borrow from the excessive merit of those who had gone before you. This is doctrine of the Church of the Middle Ages. And it is doctrine today. And so you could borrow, if you like, take for yourself a deep spoon of the merit of the saints that had gone before to augment the paucity of your own merits. 
Is that biblical? Or does each one stand before God in the judgment and gives an account for what he has done in the flesh, yes or no? Yes, of course. And so all these saints were created, and then eventually the saints became specialized, and that specialization is exactly the same as that you had in paganism. One God was specialist in taking care of you during traveling. Another one was a specialist in taking care of your financial needs, and so you had various gods. And so today, if you want to travel, well, it's good to have a St. Christopher around, because that might just, you know, help you in your travels. So, this is a church of compromise. And with Jesus Christ, there can be no compromise. Either he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, or he is not. And that is the choice that we have to make. As we go into the next part of the story of the riders of the apocalypse, we come to a pale horse, one that represents death. So obviously there's a shift in this time when the Gospel Herald became black, darkened through compromise, to a point of death. The Gospel has died. The Bible says quite clearly, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the sea. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. Exodus 20 verse 4 and 5. Problematic text in the Ten Commandments. So how about just removing it? Throwing it into the dustbin. Well, if you look at a normal catechism book today, you will find that this commandment has been removed to open the way for the practices that went before. Constantine is the one who first and foremost started to make legislation that would bind the conscience of human beings. So rather than listening and accepting the word of God and making your decisions based on the word of God, man started legislating on this issue. And Constantine was the first one to legislate a day of rest, for example. During this age of compromise, the pagans' day of the sun replaced the Bible Sabbath. Very interesting development that happened over there. The early church kept the Sabbath. There were two regions where the Sabbath was not kept in the early church. The one was in Alexandria, where you had the very liberal school, which later became the seat of Gnosticism, and the other one was in Rome. And those two areas were the bastion of sun worship. It's interesting that when Alexandria was destroyed, the shift of power moved towards Rome and eventually spread across the entire world. So during this age of compromise, the day of the sun replaced the Bible Sabbath. We are told by Eusebius, by the way, that is the bishop that was active in Constantine's time, that Constantine, in order to recommend the new religion to the heathen, transferred into it the outward ornaments to which they had been accustomed in their own. Development of the Christian doctrine, page 372. So this is what they started doing. They started compromising on these issues. Arthur P. Stanley says, Constantine's coins bore on the one side the letters of the name of Christ and on the other the figure of the sun god, as if he could not dare to relinquish the patronage of the bright luminary. Interesting name, luminary. Today we also have people who consider themselves luminaries illuminated ones. There's even an organization which calls itself the Illuminati. We'll be dealing with those issues as we go along. So here is a compromise that has taken place.
The retention of the old pagan name of Dies Solus, or Sunday, is in a great measure owing to the union of pagan and Christian sentiment with which the first day of the week was recommended by Constantine to his subject, pagan and Christian alike, as the venerable day of the sun. History of the Eastern Church, page 184. So this is historic fact. We cannot deny it. This is what happened. For in six days, says the Bible, the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. Wow, is that sentence under attack today in the scientific world? Yes or no? Like you cannot believe. There is hardly a word in the word of God that is not being assailed in this day and age that we live in. All that in them is, and he rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and he hallowed it. Exodus 20 verse 11. So here were issues of compromise that were coming in. They were changing the face of Christianity. Now what about all those dear Christians that wanted to do exactly what the scriptures said? What happened to them? They were eliminated off the face of the earth. They were destroyed by sword. And the story of how it was done is the most diabolical, scariest story that we can imagine in the world today. Wow! Where did the early church reign? Where did Christianity start? Did it start in Rome? Yes or no? No. It started in Jerusalem. That's where it started. That's where Christianity has its seat. And it spread across the Middle East. Where did Paul do most of his preaching? He went to Rome to die, but where did he establish the churches? In Asia Minor. That's where he preached. And that's where the church grew. And the church grew across the entire region, which is today Iraq and Iran and Pakistan, all the way up to India. That's what the Bible says. And into Egypt and into the north of Africa. That's where the cradle of Christianity was. And today, Christianity has been obliterated from its seat of origin and has been replaced by an entirely different religion which denies Christ and his divinity. Interesting thought. We'll come to that in a moment. And God blessed the seventh day and he sanctified it because that in it he rested from all the work which God created and made. The Catholic Encyclopedia tells us the church after changing the day of rest from the Jewish Sabbath or seventh day of the week to the first made the third commandment referred to Sunday as the day to be kept holy as the Lord's day. The Catholic Encyclopedia, volume 4, page 153. Well, why the third commandment? Why not the fourth like it was in the Bible? Because they had removed the second commandment, which says, Thou shalt not make for yourself an idol. Now, is that not messing with the word of God? Isn't that rewriting the scriptures? Absolutely. So not only did they take the authority of God away, who said, remember the seventh day because I am your creator and I made you, they took it away and said, no, I will decide when you shall do what and I am the new authority in your life. So it's not a question of a day as much as it is a question of authority. Who has authority? The one who makes the law is the one who has the authority. The one who changes the law is the one who says he has more authority than the one that went before, right or wrong. So here is a power that says, I have more authority than God, I'll change it. It's a question of authority. Don't mess with God. Her priests have violated my law and have profaned mine holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean and have hid their eyes from my Sabbath and I'm profaned amongst them. Ezekiel 22, 26. That's an interesting statement. 
So they profane the Sabbaths, they make no difference between clean and unclean. Hang on a second. Aren't we taught today that there is a difference? That there is no difference anymore? Isn't that right? I mean, if you read the NIV, it even says there, thereby Jesus declared that all things are now clean. That's what the NIV says. King James doesn't say it, but the NIV says it. Very interesting. We'll have to look into that issue. It's a bit complicated now. It's just sort of to whet your appetites. So the black horse represented this time of compromise when things started to change, and by 538 AD, a decree went out that a certain power, the Bishop of Rome, had the power to become the corrector of heretics. That means he became the authority to dictate the conscience of men. Interesting. Not God. Man had taken that position. And once man usurps the authority of God, then the gospel is dead. Because my Bible says there is no other name whereby you can be saved. And my Bible says there is no other mediator except the man Christ Jesus. And my Bible also says that if somebody sins, we have an advocate. And that advocate is Jesus Christ. But now we have another advocate. We have to go elsewhere to find forgiveness. And we have someone who tells us what's right and what's wrong, contrary to what the Word of God said. This is problematic. This is problematic. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I looked and behold a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death. And hell followed with him. Hades, the grave. This is a sad story of how a gospel message of salvation was taken to the point of death. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth. So this power that takes away the gospel herald controlled a fourth part of the earth. Well, an interesting point. Which Christian denomination controlled the fourth part of the world? Wow. To kill with a sword, that's a new word, and a literal sword, and with hunger. Hunger for what? There's a famine in the land for what? For the word of God. Did the church of the Middle Ages take the word of God away, yes or no? Did it ban the Bible? Was it a sin to the point of death to have and read the Bible, yes or no? Yes, history proves the fact. I'm not attacking any individual. I'm talking about a system. And what is behind the system? There are many, many, many dear people hungering for truth in every single religion in the world. And I believe many of them God recognizes as his own because they are living up to the best light that they have. So let's not be judgmental. We're talking about a system. And uh, it's a sad, sad system. My father wanted to be a Roman Catholic priest. He was a very, very good Catholic. I was raised a Roman Catholic. And uh, I became an atheist, but I became a Catholic again. And when I discovered the Bible... I saw that there were so many issues that were not biblical. And I had to make a choice. And I believe everybody has to come to that point where he has to make a choice between being fooled by the systems of man or by the systems of God. And with death and with the beasts of the earth. So how did he kill? He killed with a sword that's literal that he made. He killed with a famine for the word of God. And he killed with a death and with beasts. Beast in Daniel is a kingdom. 
The four beasts you saw are four kingdoms that shall arise upon the earth. Daniel chapter 7. So, he killed with political powers. Did the church of the Middle Ages do that, yes or no? Absolutely. Take the Valdenses. The Valdenses were destroyed off the face of the earth. The Albigenses, France. The first alliance between a European nation and Rome was with the Franks. Clovis became a champion emperor for the cause. And any opposition was destroyed. And the gospel died. Man had taken the position of God. So the new Christians were, as far as thinking and habits went, the same as the old pagans. Their surge into the churches did not wipe out paganism. On the contrary, hordes of baptized pagans meant that paganism had diluted the moral energies of organized Christianity to the point of impotence. Centuries of Christianity, a concise history, page 58. History attests to the facts. And unfortunately, I cannot change them. I didn't invent them. I'm just telling you what the book of Revelation says about these issues. The faith had died. And formalism took the place of a simple, beautiful trust in the Son of God. Do you know, when I was a Catholic, I used to sit in the church and I used to know that according to the teaching, the host was in the tabernacle and that was God. And I could pray to him. I used to sit there and I used to say, why don't you answer me? Why can I not bring my problems to you and speak to you as to a friend? Everything is ritual. If you want to communicate with God, say ten Hail Marys, one Our Father, ten Hail Marys, one Our Father, ten Hail Marys, one Our Father, and pray right through the rosary and end up with the confession of faith. And if you haven't got it done yet, do it again and again and again. And the more you do it, the better. Is that communicating with someone? Is that how you would speak to someone you love? You know, man has a hunger to communicate with God. Man has a hunger to touch and feel the divine hand. And man is being robbed of the beauty and the simplicity of communication with God. Prayer is not bringing God down to us. Prayer is bringing us up to God. Isn't that a beautiful sense of upliftment? We are left down here with all the problems of the world with no solution when God is just a prayer away. If we would say, Lord, I have a problem. Can I come to you? I'm sure the Lord will incline his ear to us and will listen to every word that troubles us. We can take our largest problems and our smallest problems directly to God. We need no one else. It is a beautiful truth. And when we discover it, then no matter how glorious and pompous and beautiful everything is, Without love, there is nothing. What, is, what does Solomon say? Rather live on the corner of the roof and rather have a house with cabbage leaves than a house filled with good food if there is no love. It's no point in it. Rather be poor and have love than to have riches and sadness. There's nothing wrong with being rich. God can bless riches as well. It's the love of money that is the root of all evil. If you leave the love of out, then you have a problem. So a union of church and state came about. Governments were used to enforce doctrine. Christianity became an established religion in the Roman Empire and took the place of paganism. Christianity as it existed in the Dark Ages might be termed baptized paganism. Church history, century 2, chapter 2, section 7. These are statements made by the church themselves. They even said the God Pan is not dead, he is baptized. So, 
paganism rules in the world today. And there is an elevation of the priesthood over man. That is the most diabolical thing that has ever happened in the history of the human race. Did you know that? To elevate one portion to control the conscience of others. And we have the same problem today. There are some who believe that because they have theology, they have the right to control your conscience. Hello? Each one is accountable to God himself. And the Bible teaches no such thing unless you change the Bible. We'll be dealing with that. It's been changed somewhere. Not in the old ones. That's still fine. You can read the old German Luther Bible. That's great. You can read the Armenian Bible. That's great. You can read any Bible from uh, Russia to Serbia. Anywhere in the world you'll find it all nice and right there. But there's a problem later on where you have an elevation of the priesthood over the general people. There's no such thing in the Bible. But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. Proverbs 4 verse 18. So the light of truth would penetrate into this darkness. God would not permit his gospel to die. So God had to do something. What was the next church that was to bring light and the word back to the people? Remember the seven churches? We had the church that came in, Sardis, and it represented the reformation to reform that which had died. It's really not a complicated concept. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Now, are these literal souls under the altar? It must be pretty crowded there. Or is this the blood of all the saints crying out to God? When are you going to do something about this? I think that's the image that we're getting here. So all those that died for the faith, all those that were destroyed for what they believed, crying out to God. And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest, sleep, yet a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. God says, I am in control. It's going to get worse. But wait till everybody throughout history that is still going to die in the faith or for the faith is together and then the kingdom will come. So these are instruments of torture that were used. Nothing could stop the gospel herald. And uh, did you know that some of these instruments of torture were still used in 1974? Very interesting. Franco in France, ach, in Spain, used those instruments of torture still in the 1970s. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Don't just give up. For there are certain men crept in unawares, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Jude chapter th verse 3 and 4. Wow. So right there in the early church, the corruption came in. And what did they deny? Jesus Christ. The only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So a shift took place in that early church already. Big problem. And we will see what they did because we will go into it in detail and how it affects us today because these smart people have done the same thing to us and we are not even aware of it. Isn't that sad? So God wants us to know like the successive strata of the earth covering one another, so layer after layer of forgeries, fabrications, was piled up in the church. The Pope and the Councils, page 117. 
Not only false gods elevating man above the deity, but actually false manuscripts corrupting the word of God as well. But there were the Valdenses. And where did they get their manuscripts? They got them from the Syrian church, from the cradle of Christianity. They didn't get them from Rome. They had the scriptures as they came down the ages. It's interesting that those nations that came across the top areas, they had these scriptures. But there were other documents that were being used in Alexandria and in Rome. We'll deal with that in another lecture. And these people made the word of God their bastion and they preached it and because of that, the ire of the world was upon them and they were fought tooth and nail. They were burnt. They were smashed the infants' heads against the rocks. They threw them down the cliffs. But the gospel would not die. This is an old Valdensian church and a Bible copyist table there. And so slowly the faith was uplifted again. In 1370, the authority of the Bible was declared with power by Wycliffe. In 1400, obedience to God, obey God rather than man, and he died for his faith. Johann Hus. These are the men dressed in white. And then salvation by grace, Martin Luther. What a stalwart. Did he do everything perfectly? Absolutely not. But man, did he live up to the knowledge that he had, didn't he? He's a champion in my eyes, and so is Johann Hus and Wycliffe. These are real champions. Tyndall and all these people that gave up their lives for this truth. Martin Luther had the courage to go and say, this is what's wrong, we have to correct it. And we saw, here I stand and I can do no other. 1521. Then John Calvin came on. Man, did he have confused ideas? predestination, this, that, and the other, all kinds of ideas. But man, did he live up to the knowledge that he had and the light that he had? Freedom of conscience. In fact, the entire American Constitution is based on what Calvin wrote. That man should be accountable to God alone for what he decides. That's the basis of the American Constitution. That's Calvinism. He had many things wrong, but boy, did he bring out this point. Right down the throat of those who opposed it. And these people died, and there are monuments in their honor today. And then Williams came along in 1650, and he discovered baptism by immersion. Beautiful truths in the Bible. Unfortunately, as we said last time, all these faiths decided they wouldn't go along with new light because they worshipped at the shrines of their founders. That's not the problem of the founders, that's the problem of the followers, right or wrong. So the followers have more of a problem than the founders, because if they discovered light, they should embrace it. But no, they wouldn't. So we have a fragmented church today. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, teaching them to observe, what does it say there? All things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. These are the issues that are important. All things. Not I will accept only what my founder discovered. All things or nothing. So if you are looking for a church, what would you do? Wouldn't you look for a church that embraces all the truths of all the faiths? Yes or no? Wouldn't you look for one that in the Bible does everything according to the doctrine at least, according to the Bible? Don't look at individuals. Individuals are not trustworthy. You must look at the Bible and what the official teaching is. And if it is what the Bible says and the Bible alone, then go along with it. Shouldn't be too difficult. Shouldn't be too difficult. And then came Wesley, and he lifted up Jesus Christ like he'd never been lifted up in the world before. The Lordship of Jesus Christ. If the Lord Jesus is not the center 
the author, the finisher of our faith, forget it. Then it's not biblical. So what a great discovery of light. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. Interesting. So we're now coming into an interesting time period. The Reformation had done its work. The churches that followed after Sardis were which ones? Do you remember? Philadelphia. And here there was an accumulation of truth. But before this event, something was going to happen. Behold, when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell onto the earth, even as fig tree casts her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind, Revelation 6, 12 and 13. These are celestial signs. Did they take place? Absolutely. Mark says the same thing. Chapter 13, verse 24. In those days after that tribulation, that tremendous persecution where God's people were virtually wiped off the face of the earth in the Middle Ages through the Inquisition and the 30-year war and the 100-year war and Bartholomew night and the Huguenots were hounded. Then came light and after that tribulation, which ended roughly... 1798, and we'll come to that in another time, another lecture. The sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. Well, here's the history of where, New Hampshire, because Christianity had fled, Bible-based Christianity had fled from Europe and established itself in a number of regions in the world. In the, the New World, the United States of America in particular, in southern Africa and in Australia. That's where Christianity had fled. Interesting story as to what's happening in those regions of the world today. The dark day of New England, so familiar to old and young, came May 19, 1780. Near 11 o'clock it began to grow dark as if night were coming. Men ceased their work. The lowing cattle came to the barns, the bleating sheep huddled about the fences, the wild birds screamed and flew to their nests, the fowls went to their roosts. At night it was so inky dark that a person could not see his hand when held up, nor even a white sheet of paper. That's the history of Ware, New Hampshire, 1735 to 1888. The Independent Chronicle of June 8, 1780 said, During the whole time a sickly, melancholy gloom overcast the face of nature. And uh, it goes on to say, that notwithstanding there was almost a full moon, which by the way was like blood, no object was discernible. And there was an Egyptian darkness impervious to the eyes. The great and memorable events, the Connecticut legislature was in session, and they gave it up because of the darkness. They sojourned. And Herschel, the great astronomer, admits that the dark day, May 19, 1780, is something that astronomy cannot explain. There was no eclipse, there was no reason, scientifically speaking, for it, but there it was, right on time. And then November 13, 1833, this amazing shower from heaven with 200,000 meteors per hour, it was so light you could read, and the interesting thing is, they came from a central point. Normally if you have shooting stars, they're all over the place, but not here. They came from a central point and spread across the sky. Nobody had ever seen something like this before. And prior to these events, there was the great Lisbon earthquake. So the sequence exactly like in the Bible. And something new had to be discovered. Well, William Miller was the one, 1782 to 1849, who started rediscovering something else in the Bible, and he discovered some of the great prophecies. Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And he calculated the days and discovered the beautiful messianic prophecies of Jesus and of the cleansing of the sanctuary. And he thought, wow, does this mean Jesus is coming again? And he started to preach that Jesus was going to come in 1844 because he figured that the cleansing of the sanctuary meant the cleansing of the earth. But of course, Jesus didn't come in 1844. So in the 1840s, there were a group of believers that called themselves Adventists. 
Now these weren't Seventh-day Adventists, these were Adventists, people that believed in the soon coming of Christ. And they came from every single Christian denomination in the areas. There were Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians, you name it, they were there. Over 200 ministers of the various churches believed in these studies that made prophecy come to life again. But of course it didn't happen. But at least what it did, it opened up the hope for the second coming and William Miller is the herald for the reestablishment of prophecy and the role of prophecy in uh, Christian history. So all these great truths coming back into the Christian thinking. And then of course a final restoration had to take place, embracing all the truths, the law of God, doctrines on death and hell and all these things, how we should live, what the parameters were that God required from us. All of these things had to be restored because surely God would not end it without light shining upon his people to open up all the truths that had been lost. Truth had to be restored. And then Christ would come. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14 verse 15. He who says he loves me and keeps not my commandments is a what? A liar and the truth is not in him. Haven't we got many groups today that say the commandments have been done away with? Yes or no? Yes, they've been nailed to the cross. Jesus says that the law will never pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away. But not one jot or one tittle will be removed from the law until all things have been accomplished. Surely it is common sense to know that if people would just keep the law of God, we can throw away all our keys. And all the young ladies and women could walk safely in the darkest alleys of this world without any fear, if everybody kept the law of God. Isn't that right? So the law of God is going to be an issue at the end of time, especially since a whole organization has had the effrontery to change it. Wow! To say we are greater and more powerful than God, we will modify his law? In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Matthew 15 verse 9. When man elevates himself to the position of or above God, and then you know that it is time for God to act. Thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in, if the turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable, there would be a restoring of the breach the gap in the wall that is supposed to protect us from evil. The law was not made to restrict us. The law was made to protect us. Like a loving father or mother would put their arms around their children and make rules to protect them. And the Sabbath was to be called a delight, not a burden. The Jews had made the Sabbath a burden. They had placed so many restrictions upon it that it was a misery to keep it. Who could be happy if you weren't even allowed to walk a couple of paces to go and meet those you love? Wow. So, there had to be a restoration of the spirit of the law and faith in the word of God. The revelation by John tells us all these things as they would unfold. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. Revelation 14, verse 6 and 7. The gospel, the everlasting gospel, had to be restored. You see, the Jews relied on obedience to the law. And they nailed Jesus to the cross. 
And the Christians rely on the merits of Jesus and nail the law to the cross. Both of them are standing on one leg. Isn't that right? The law and the gospel, they go together. If you want to choose Jesus as your saviour, you must be prepared to accept him as your king. Isn't that right? And a king is a ruler. And a ruler, by the very name, has rules, right or wrong. Yes. And what's so difficult about loving Jesus enough to keep his commandments? It's not so tough. If I love my wife with all my heart and with all my soul, well, I want another. Absolutely not. And if I think of the consequences that it would cause, the pain and the suffering, would it even be worth it? I don't think so. Same with God. If I love God with all my heart and with all my soul, would I want to serve another? Why not? They're useless. They can't save me. They can't do anything for me. Even if I had a selfish motive, it would be better to stay true to God, yes or no? Yes. So the law makes sense. So, here is the message that says, God is the creator. What's the world teach? You came from evolution. You are the product of a rock. That's what it says, yes. The earth dissolved, created eventually the materials out of which life evolved spontaneously, so you come from a rock. I believe that I come from a rock, but the rock of ages. And the other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also must I bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. You cannot have a divided truth. Either there is truth, or there is division. And you cannot have unity in falsehood. Yes or no? No. You either have unity in truth, or there is no unity. There is only a presumptive unity, that at the first trouble will fall apart as though it had never existed. Either it is based on truth or it's based on nothing. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Revelation 14, 12. Do you know what? Fascinating sentence there. The faith of Jesus. Wow. The Bible has very high standards. Do you know that it's not enough to have faith in Jesus? It's not enough. You need the faith of Jesus. In the greatest adversary, Jesus trusted in the merits of his Father. Yes or no? Yes. No matter what happens to you, you need to trust like he trusted. That's the standard. Well, God adds his merit because we are weak and we cannot do these things. But that's the standard. That's something to aim for. Well, I wish I had the faith of Jesus. That I would be willing to go to the cross because I knew that he would resurrect me and I would be his eternally. I could die no matter what happened. Jesus had that faith. We need that kind of faith. How many people have that kind of faith still today? The standards in the Bible are high. And they're high with a reason. And the message goes out to the world that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we are right here. And the heavens departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were removed out of their places. We've gone through all the seals. We're right between the sixth and the seventh seal. The next thing that happens when that last seal is opened then the testament of God is open and the kingdom becomes the Lord's. That means Jesus takes over on this planet and he's coming again. We've been through history. We are the last people, the last ones in this great message. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondsman and every freedman hid themselves in dens and rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? That's the next thing that's going to happen. And by the way, please look that the people hide themselves. There's no 
great joy by the great multitudes. Ah, when judgment comes, you have to stand. There's no such thing as everyone will be saved. You have to make a decision here. And then follows chapter 7, which is parenthetical and tells us who will be able to stand. And it says, only the sealed will be able to stand. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Well, if you work that into prophetic time, it's about a week, or exactly a week. So the question is, what is the silence about? I believe heaven is empty, because Christ and all his angels are down here to receive the redeemed. Christ is coming again with power and glory. And either we are rooted in him, or we are not. That is the choice that we have. And I would suggest that we accept the fact that Jesus is in control. Jesus has given us a vision of the great throne room, where he is seated in the throne of power. And he is the one who has the authority to open the seals, to receive a kingdom. And we can be part of it, or we can reject it. My prayer is that we will all accept salvation in him, because he is the only name whereby we can be saved. Amen.